All right, so off we go. Um, I was gone last week, um, and I'm going to tell you why. So I'm going to start with the great humanist, a <laughs> very uh, uh, egocentric way to start, I suppose, uh, <laughs> Petrarch, um, who was an early <clears throat> spirit of the uh, Renaissance. And he, he, made, he climbed a mountain and he made a big deal about it. Um, and he even claimed that he was the first person since antiquity, antiquity to have climbed a mountain for just the pleasure of it. And uh, that's doubtful, but nevertheless, it's taken as a new spirit of, of uh, the Renaissance. He um, uh, loved uh, the Greeks uh, and, and what they left, and he specialized in trying to uh, bring that um, to uh, medieval um, uh, Florence. Um, so what did I do last week? I didn't climb up a mountain. I um, had Ico drive me up to the top of Mount <laughs> Diablo. And uh, I spent the night up there with a couple of friends. Um, and we had a not very nice uh, uh, camp dinner and we got up and had a nice camping breakfast. And the next morning we walked down the mountain. Um, so off we went um, and down we went and we made it all the way to Castle Rock. If those of you who know where Castle Rock is and I made it, but uh, uh, a little tired. Anyway, another pioneer who was maybe more hardy than me was um, uh, the Russian Daniel Boone. So we're going back now to um, Russia and I'm gonna overlap a little bit where we left off since it's been uh, two weeks. And where we left off was uh, Russia's exploration of uh, Siberia and conquering of Siberia. And these are the Cossacks that this uh, Yermak assembled. Uh, this is the derivation of the term Cossacks. Um, uh, uh, the part of the, the peasantry that wanted a little bit of adventure, a little bit like our cowboys, a little bit. Um, and off they went and they uh, got a lot of furs and pelts in Siberia and they bought them back to uh, uh, Ivan uh, the Terrible, uh, also known as Ivan the IV. Fourth. Um, and um, the Tatars, however, took um, revenge on, um, took revenge on uh, Yermak and uh, he uh, drowned in this uh, famous battle because he was wearing armor. Um, uh, Yermak, however, um, uh, made it onto the uh, Novgorod uh, great uh, millennial uh, statuary collection that I keep uh, talking about, uh, the famous uh, people that the Russians deem worthy in their story of, of, of what they say is their uh, history. And um, uh, he's uh, celebrated in many places uh, in, in Siberia as a great explorer, much like Daniel Boone and Davy Crockett are celebrated in, uh, in America. So this is the, uh, the map I've shown repeatedly. This was where the Ivan started, this, this kind of pale green area. But within 60 years, they had reached all the way to the, the Pacific uh, um, Ocean. And um, I'm, uh, I, I include on the map here um, uh, some additions later on um, and one of the additions was the return of the Ukraine, the Ukraine, which is in the news now because Putin is uh, lining up his troops along the border of the Ukraine. And maybe he wants to duplicate what happened in 1686 when the Ukraine 
defected from the uh, Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth. And uh, after 300 years being away, Kiev returned to Russian culture, left Catholic culture and returned um, uh, to uh, Russian culture. Um, and who knows, maybe that uh, uh, Putin's got a memory of, of this or has some other memory that is more um, uh, uh, justifying what he, he is threatening uh, to do. Um, but the, uh, the Ukraine is important because it's one of the breadbaskets I'm gonna talk about. So when it returned to mother Russian culture, which it had started, remember, with the Vikings that came down the, the, the Dnieper uh, to Kiev, um, it offered a uh, food for the people that were settling in Siberia. And so did the Volga. The Volga had been inhabited by nomads and had never, never seen agriculture. But uh, Russia uh, introduced agriculture, tried to, uh, uh, to the Volga, but they, they, they had a lack of um, uh, informed uh, farmers. Um, and so what did they do? They recruited from um, uh, Germany. Um, that seems strange because of, as we look back, the tension between the Russians and, and the Germans, but this is just one example of the mixing of uh, the two ethnic uh, groups. And a whole group settled along um, the, the Volga and in, in the, the uh, Ukraine. So here they are, are over here um, on the, the Volga. And uh, this is the German Russia Volga area, all these German names. Um, and who could have recruited them? Who got all these German farmers to pick up and, and leave? Um, uh, Germany had been suffering with a, a series of religious wars. So uh, there was a, a, maybe a reason to want to go to the Volga. And once they got there, you had the mixing of German and uh, Russian culture. Uh, this guy's got a German pipe uh, in his hand. Um, and there they were. Uh, and here was a, a recruitment poster. Come to the, the Volga, all you Germans. Um, and they settled there. And who invited the Germans? Well, here's Tsar Peter III. If you guessed it was Peter III that invited them, you'd be wrong. It was his wife, Catherine, a German princess. Uh, uh, and she had him deposed and she took over as Catherine the Great. Um, and how in the world did she become uh, Peter's uh, husband and then the Empress of Russia, for heaven's sakes? Um, uh, and here she is in her glory um, uh, later in life. We'll get to her later on. I'm just giving this as a filling in a little bit on the story of Siberia. Um, and uh, Frederick the Great had been the great matchmaker. Uh, Frederick was, was uh, quite an, an emperor in, in Germany. He was a, a Renaissance man, if you will, enlightened, played the flute like my wife. Um, and uh, he was called Old Fritz. He was very interested in agriculture and pr the practicality of building up an, an empire. Um, and uh, he was a great conqueror. Uh, he enlarged uh, Prussia uh, many fold um, and N uh, Napoleon famously paid homage at his tomb when he conquered uh, Berlin. Um, and uh, Frederick the Great was very much involved in what we call the uh, French and Indian War, what Europe calls the Seven Years War. Arguably, he may have started it. 
Um, but he fought on the side of the English. And so you'll see in England many King of Prussia uh, pubs. And if you go to Pennsylvania, there's a town called King of Prussia. So uh, back in colonial days, uh, Frederick the Great was uh, on our side, a good guy. Um, and so um, Catherine and uh, Frederick and uh, 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 Joseph uh, of Austria-Hungary um, uh, look at a map and it's once again, it's time to divide Poland. After Poland, um, uh, 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 their Polish-Lithuanian um, uh, Commonwealth uh, dissolved, they became ripe for attack from the three great powers. And when we get to uh, the Enlightenment much later, we'll come back uh, to, to this wonderful uh, graphic that shows, uh, takes on all three of these uh, great um, emperors and uh, uh, sees where they overlap and how enlightened they are and how absolutist they are. And we'll come back to that. But there's an interesting postscript, an American postscript to this story. Uh, Catherine had attracted the uh, German uh, peasant farmers by saying, if you come and uh, farm the Volga land, I won't draft you for the army. I won't tax you. And you can make all the beer you want without any regulation. As time went on in the mid 1800s, um, the uh, uh, Russian uh, farmers started saying, wait a minute, how's come these Germans get special protection? Uh, they should have to serve in the military. They should have to pay taxes. Um, and they should have to pay taxes on beer that they make. And so there was pressure, political pressure, and the special privileges of the Volga Germans who'd been there second and third generation were withdrawn. And the Germans became disenchanted. And they were recruited one more time. Uh, but where? To, by the great railroads that were being built in, in America. And a whole group of them um, made it to uh, Galveston, um, which uh, was kind of an Ellis Island West. Uh, some people call Angel Island uh, Ellis Island West. But a whole bunch of Germans came in um, through, through uh, Texas. Um, and there was the, their uh, Ellis Island. And here, here they as one family. And so if you go to like Fredericksburg, Texas, huh, Fredericksburg, who's that named after? That's named after Frederick the Great. You will see portraits of Catherine the Great in Fredericksburg, Texas, bought by the Volga uh, Germans who em emigrated for a second time, um, uh, but to Texas. Famously, um, Ludwig Erhard, who was chancellor of Germany, was the first foreign leader to visit um, uh, LBJ after he assumed the presidency. The trip had been scheduled with uh, JFK uh, before the assassination and LBJ uh, saying, we're going to continue, um, uh, kept it going, took him to the ranch in Texas and took him to Fredericksburg, where he saw some portraits of Catherine the Great, the most famous German princess uh, of all. Um, now, back to Siberia. So, um, uh, you got two bread baskets, you've got the Ukraine, you've got the Volga. And as they came across all the way to Siberia, and this guy named Bering, who uh, had a strait named after him, um, uh, explored the uh, 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 Pacific Ocean off the coast of Siberia and discovered, hey, Alaska is a pretty cool place. Um, uh, the Russians famously took over uh, Alaska 
And of course, we later uh, bought him, bought it from them during the Lincoln administration. It was known as Seward's Folly when we when we bought it, but that wasn't until Lincoln. Uh, the, before it was turned over to Americans, there were Russian settlers in Alaska and they needed food. And so where do you go if you're in Sitka, Alaska and you're uh, starving? Um, you head south to the first uh, civilization that's growing food. And the first agriculture civilization uh, was San Francisco, our very own uh, Bay Area. Um, you'll see at that time, the Spanish territory went uh, two thirds the way up California, but this land, Northern California and Oregon was a no man's land. Um, and at the time there was intrigue, a three-way uh, race, uh, uh, actually four-way between the uh, United States, Russia, Spain, and this uh, England, um, uh, Great Britain, which still uh, 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 was involved particularly in Canada. So um, the attraction besides food was uh, beaver pelts. So just like um, uh, Siberia uh, made an economic name for itself with pelts that famously they could sell throughout uh, Europe. In, in America, it was uh, uh, beavers. Um, and this guy uh, made his first millions in the beaver trade. Um, and how did he make so much money in the beaver trade? He, 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 he took ships full of beaver pelts to China and made a lot of money. And he, he built uh, Astoria um, uh, 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 as one of his ports um, to uh, load the, the, the beaver pelts on and move them um, around the world. Uh, he later. John, uh, uh, Astoria, where is that in Oregon or where is it? Is that, this is in Oregon. Um, and so uh, he saw the writing on the wall that the, 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 he, it was time to get out of the beaver trade. And so he got into uh, New York real estate and became even, even uh, more wealthy. But uh, Astoria in Oregon is named after uh, him. Um, by the way, there's a new movie out called First Cow, which is about the Oregon Territory when it was still a no man's land. It's a fascinating movie about uh, American and Chinese settlers living uh, together um, in, in uh, Oregon. First Cow. Um, so um, the Russians are sitting in uh, uh, Alaska, in Sitka, and they're starving. So they sent one of their explorers, Count Rezanov, it's always a count, right? Um, they sent him down to uh, San Francisco, our own San Francisco in 1806. Um, and he was to meet the Comandante of the Presidio um, and uh, try to set up a trade deal. Um, and uh, they, they were hoping that that would bind an alliance between Russia and Spain. And Spain. But Rosanov also fell in love with the Comandante's daughter. Uh, and he would like to marry Conchita, his daughter. I'll tell you why she had a nickname, because this is her whole name. Um, and I think Rob knows uh, the Arguello part uh, all too well, which is a street in uh, San Francisco. Uh, we have a Moraga um, right out here in good old Contra Costa. So she had a very long name, but uh, I'm gonna call her Conchita. Um, and so they were going to get married, but there's a problem. Remember this red line? There's two kinds of Christianity now. 
On this side is the Roman Catholicism type of Christianity with a little Protestantism mixed in or a lot of Protestantism mixed in. And on this side of the line, it's uh, um, Orthodox. Orthodox from originally from Constantinople, but by this time Constantinople has fallen and Russia has been uh, uh, grandly taken on the title of the third Rome. So you had the first Rome and then Constantinople uh, fashioned itself as the second Rome after the barbarians sacked Rome. And then after the Turks sacked Constantinople and turned it into Istanbul, uh, Russia takes on the title of uh, the third Rome. So there's a problem between um, an, a Russian Orthodox and a Catholic getting married and um, the uh, Spanish uh, uh, missionary priest said, nah, well, we, you got to get special dispensation uh, from, from the Pope uh, so before you can get married. And so uh, Rosanov uh, took off uh, he went back to uh, Setka. He said, uh, uh, we got a deal with San Francisco for food, but I got to go to um, uh, Europe uh, to do something. And off he went, uh, presumably, to, to uh, try to get the Pope's approval. Uh, however, he died in this city. He died in this city here on his way back. Um, and there's a monument in this city uh, to, to him. Um, and on one side, uh, it has the count saying, I will never uh, forget you. And on the other side, uh, for Conchita, they, they say, Conchita says, I will see you never more. And these two lines, whether they were ever uttered or not, um, became lines in a popular um, rock opera uh, performed in Russia. Um, and it was first performed in 1979 um, when the, the, the communists were still in charge. So they allowed this. Um, and in 2007, the sheriff of Arbenicia, yes, the one right across the uh, Carquinas Straits, um, which is where Conchita uh, came to rest um, at St. Dominic Cemetery. The sheriff bought a handful of earth and a rose um, from Conchita's gravesite to Ro Rosanov's grave. Um, so this is one of the stories of history uh, that enchant me. Um, and so I went uh, to Benicia as part of our um, standard of always going to a historical site if you find out about it. And here's what the cemetery uh, looks like. This is uh, the poorer part of the cemetery. Here's where the prominent and rich people are buried up on the hill. Um, and I walked around uh, over there and I could not find the, 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 the grave. So I, I will have to get more information and, and uh, uh, go back. Um, while I was there, incidentally, um, uh, uh, it's St. Uh, Dominic. That's what the, uh, uh, the cemetery's named for. I said, well, that's interesting. And yeah, I'll walk around the statue and wait a minute. What, what's a dog? doing on a statue of a saint. Huh, that's interesting. So thank God for the internet. You come back and you find out more information about Saint Dominic, who was the founder of the Dominican order, which we talked about a lot when we talked about how Western Europe was reformulating itself after the sack of Rome and the barbarians sweeping through uh, and we found out that it was, it was the church and the monasteries that helped put things back together. Sure, it took a couple of centuries, um, but uh, uh, St. Dominic uh, uh, contributed to that. Uh, St. Benedict obviously was the, the first one. 
And so why the dog? Well, there's two stories. One was that his mother, who had been unable to ha have children, dreamt that a dog leapt out of her womb, uh, carrying a flaming torch in his mouth. Or um, the Dominican order, it may have been a play on words because in Latin, uh, it's Dominicanus. And if you want to play around with those words, you can make it into Dominicanus or dog of the Lord. So take your pick. There's always different versions of history. Um, I throw in this slide, this was, I, I was not present for this, uh, but I saw it, that this is a active uh, cemetery um, with um, uh, processions periodically. And this is where it is. If anybody wants to go, it's real easy, 780, take uh, 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 Fifth Street uh, up and, and uh, there you are. It's interesting that um, Conchita, who died in 1857, uh, so uh, she died almost 50 years after uh, Rezanov, um, that she really initially was not buried here. There was another cemetery uh, that was uh, underneath uh, Venetia's Safeway. Um, and uh, she was moved in uh, 1890. Uh, so anyway, back to how she's remembered in, um, uh, the, in San Francisco. This is a painting from a chapel at the uh, Presidio um, and uh, purporting to uh, show the, the two of them as uh, 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 imagined and fantasized by an artist. Um, but back to this Russian rock opera, I'm just going to give you a little more flavor because uh, it gives you a difference in our national characters. This story is lost to us, but this story is a big time thing in good old passionate uh, Russia. Uh, Bret Hart did write a, a poem about it. And um, uh, Gertrude Atherton, a uh, familiar name, uh, uh, wrote about uh, Sister Dominica, uh, as Conchita uh, was known, because when she finally accepted after a long time that Rozanov was not coming back, she became a, a, a nun, became a Sister uh, Dominica. Um, and so here we are. Uh, the name of the opera is called Juno and uh, Avros, and it's uh, uh, a name for the, the boats that Rozanov took down uh, from Sitka. And this guy, Voznesinsky, is a very famous uh, Russian poet. So they, they enlisted their best talent to tell uh, this story. Um, and tell it, they did. Tell it, they did. Tell it, they did. And tell it, they did. And they even wanted to tell it here. So they bought it over here as a US national tour. Notice the dates, 2020. COVID has just struck. So what was scheduled to be an, uh, a milestone event in San Francisco, one of the daughters of San Francisco immortalized in a Russian uh, rock opera uh, had to be uh, canceled. Um, so there you are. Rozanov's legacy. I'm gonna give you a second and see how many of you just to yourself, know where this is. I think it's in Northern California. That's Fort Ross. There you go, Fort Ross. Um, uh, and so uh, now we're talking about eight years after Rozanov's uh, visit, um, the Russians realized that they could build in that no man's land um, 
the uh, the, uh, the, the military assessment of the Presidio was pretty low, uh, that the, the, the Spanish were not going to chase them out. And of course, Spain was going to lose um, uh, 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 everything in the Mexican Revolution. Uh, but Fort Ross was there and stayed there in no man's land uh, for, for quite a while. Obviously, uh, uh, after the War of 1848 that we fought with Mexico, um, uh, the, America took, took over the, the title. Um, and uh, this is for Juan Jose, who I guess is going to have to be watching this later. When he comes, uh, we'll take him on this uh, two-hour ride um, up to uh, Fort Ross. Um, Anyway, uh, can I just interrupt you for a second? Did you notice that church? Now I wonder if that's um, they built it to to uh, emulate um, Russian architecture because it reminds me very much of the building on our uh, um, uh, trip up the was it the Volga uh, that in uh, from Moscow to St. Petersburg. Remember that church is built in the same fashion. Well, yeah, it's a Russian church. <laughs> so yeah. uh, it wouldn't uh, uh, it, it, it would make sense. Um, so uh, I've taken a little bit of liberty. Um, uh, we're ordinarily supposed to uh, stop at 1500, but the Siberia story was one of those things I wanted to finish. I've done this a couple of times. Uh, when it's just hard to break a story at 1500. So I took the liberty of finishing uh, Siberia and the, and the connection to San Francisco in particular. So now we go back um, to uh, 1500, before 1500, uh, Ivan, uh, the terrible's on the throne and something terrible happens uh, to Istanbul. The Ottoman Turks overrun uh, Istanbul and Constantinople falls uh, and, and uh, so does uh, the second Rome. Um, so you can make the argument that um, Constantinople was really continuing 2000 years of Roman civilization. Because uh, we start the clock with Roman civilization 500 years uh, BCE um, when the, the Roman uh, Republic and the Roman Senate first got established. The Roman Senate, of course, uh, uh, was uh, abolished by Julius Caesar, who became a, a dictator. But it had a few hundred years run. Uh, it was often rocky, that's for, that's for sure. But arguably, uh, 2,000 years um, uh, and uh, Byzant uh, Byzantium uh, continued everything um, for uh, an additional uh, 1,000. So Rome lasted 1,000, uh, started in 500 BCE, lasted until 500 AD um, uh, or CE, I, I'm supposed to say. Um, and uh, uh, the, the um, Byzantium picked up the baton for another thousand years. So that's 2000 years uh, and the Ottoman Turks uh, took it over and extended um, their hegemony into the Balkans, uh, knocked on the door of Vienna a few times. Um, and so this is where Ru Russia says, huh, um, we, uh, are the third Rome. Um, and th this has a lot of consequences. Um, the, uh, uh, it, it influenced uh, uh, Russia's uh, thinking. Uh, it in, as they're, if they're a, uh, uh, a millennial kind of a messianic state, um, it influences their attitude towards authority, uh, towards democracy. Um, and um, uh, they uh, uh, have an identity that is not Western European. Um, and it has uh, isolated them. 
um, uh, over, over the years, a book, Russian uh, Messianism, that they represent the true uh, uh, Christianity. And they even get uh, try to get involved in Jerusalem later in history. Um, so uh, it's a tough neighborhood over there. And I just want to contrast things um, with um, what, where we left off in Western Europe, in the high Middle Ages, with Thomas Aquinas. Just think about Russia at the time of Ivan the Terrible. Aquinas, there's nobody there in, like Aquinas, nobody even uh, uh, approaching that. There's nobody there like, like Peter Abelard that is, who is skeptical and challenging and questioning. Um, there's nobody there like Roger Bacon, who at Oxford is beginning to do some uh, practical uh, experiments uh, with optics. Um, and and uh, granted, uh, he took some of the knowledge that the Arabs uh, were passing down at Cordoba. So a lot of um, uh, Western scholars uh, took a trip to uh, um, Islamic Spain, to Cordoba, where they had kept a, a lot of the Christian, uh, uh, I'm sorry, Greek uh, tradition alive. So somebody like Petrarch would have been fascinated to know what the Arabs had kept uh, uh, alive. And uh, Petrarch is uh, uh, one of our best examples of, of humanism. Um, and arguably so is, is Abelard, that, uh, uh, that, that he's not gonna accept without questioning uh, God. He's, he's interested in, in uh, what, how humans can process what God may have in store for, for us. Um, and, and this is the guy that I, I started uh, with uh, today. Um, and he, he captured the, the new spirit of the uh, Renaissance. Now, um, before I go on and, and, and get back to Western Europe, I wanna break for just a second because some of you that, that have joined uh, recently, I've been trying to figure out how you can access um, our, our previous talks that are um, on, on YouTube. Um, and unfortunately, um, uh, YouTube doesn't let me manipulate the order of uh, the playlists. And we've done a few things out of sequence. We've thrown in lectures on um, uh, American history as it relates to uh, world politics. We've thrown in uh, some lectures on uh, uh, medicine, medical topics, particularly relating to pandemics and immunizations and, and COVID. Um, but what I've done uh, on a trial basis is I've put together under a word file um, a list uh, uh, in sequence of the, the lectures that are um, uh, recorded. Um, and I've sent you a copy of that file. And I, I just want to show you uh, a, a second how that might operate. So let me uh, stop share for just a second and see if uh, my word file is still there. Uh, yes, it is. So here we go. I'll share this. So you uh, will all have uh, something like this. Can you see this, by the way? Yes. Okay. So you'll have something. Uh, uh, you'll have this file. Now, all of these um, uh, uh, titles are actually links. So you see when I go over them, the little finger comes up. Uh, if yes. you if you click on that, that'll take you right into the into YouTube, right into my playlist, right into that particular file. And I just can't do it within YouTube. So what I'm going to do is uh, you'll have this as the basic, um, and I've I've numbered uh, uh, them all. Uh, uh, today I will ad be adding Siberia conquered. Um, which is recording at this very moment. Um, 
And you'll see the very last one is uh, Carol's presentation on Leonardo, which is where we're headed uh, now. Uh, so once I go back, um, so you, you'll, you'll have this. When I click on it, I won't do it now because who knows what will happen. But when I click on it, um, it the, my browser uh, starts a, a, a new uh, um, uh, uh, link uh, and it goes right into the YouTube. It starts running immediately. So I hope it works that way for you. If it doesn't, we'll, we'll talk about it uh, next, next week. Um, so you have that. I sent it earlier uh, this morning. And this is just for the lectures that I've done on world history. The ones, uh, I will come up with a similar list for the um, lectures that have gone in or the talks that have gone into American history and that have gone into the, the realm of, of medicine. So that those aren't on here. I thought, well, I thought I'd keep it simple uh, for those of you that want to focus on, on uh, the, the world history. Any questions? Where do you get the time to do all this, John? This is amazing. Great. Thank you so much for all the organizing. Okay, my it's it's my yeah. pleasure. And I I know that some people, you know, they've just joined us and they can they can catch up. So yeah. it it, uh, it is uh, uh, a way to do that. So I uh, are there any questions about Russia? If there's not, I'll I'll go on and get started on uh, uh, the early Renaissance. Oh, I have a question. With all that seems to be happening in the news these days about Russia and Navalny and Ukraine, do you have any comments about what's happening right now? Well, no. Um, I, uh, I, I, what I try to provide here is uh, a historical background. So all that I have to add is um, the, the Russian history um, that we've gone over in the last month uh, and what Russians think about it is what counts. Uh, it, uh, I, who knows what truth is? Um, and I'm not a historian. I don't go deep into what actually happened. It's, I focus pretty much on, on what people think happened and how that might be influence, influencing them. And any uh, Russian nationalist will look at the Ukraine and will look at Kiev and say, that's where our culture started. Um, uh, and it, it should not be in foreign hands. Uh, a Russian nationalist would say that. A Russian internationalist would say, oh, we've all got to live together. And if they want to join uh, the, uh, the European Union, well, maybe we should too. <laughs> or if they want to join NATO, maybe we should too. Uh, but there's a lot more nationalists than there are internationalists uh, at the moment. Although, uh, uh, Navalny is a real challenge to Putin, and, and their economy is not doing well. It, it's a, a uh, uh, hydrocarbon economy, um, so uh, there's not, not much in the way of fun, fun jobs. So they, ha they have done a good job with uh, their new uh, COVID vaccine. Sputnik, as they call it, uh, uh, going back to their glory days. So they do do some things very well, and they have a very active uh, uh, scientific community. They do not have a very active manufacturing community, however. Um, so um, uh, I don't know any more than you do uh, about the, the current thing. So I won't uh, uh, go beyond the history, but that's, uh, and we, you know, when we did the history, we looked at the Crimea. He's already grabbed the Crimea and we see how important the Crimea was. Uh, that's where Vladimir was uh, baptized. We showed the, uh, the, the church that's built on the site where uh, Vladimir 
the, uh, the great was, was baptized, the, the father of Russian uh, culture, arguably, um, in uh, uh, the 800s. Uh, so there's a, there, there, there's a long uh, tradition. And of course, uh, Crimea has got fantastic warm water uh, ports uh, and, and the military. So it's not all uh, uh, nationalistic, uh, uh, patriotism. It's very practical uh, uh, military and, and a commercial uh, value to those, uh, those ports. Um, you could go into the history of uh, the Ukraine uh, changing hands. Uh, I told you earlier that it had um, uh, been taken over by Poland, Lithuania, uh, uh, by, uh, militarily. They were so weakened um, uh, and uh, the Mongols had come through and just uh, abolished everything. And they were staggering. The Mongols finally left Kiev and they were staggering and Lithuania swooped in and conquered it and bought it uh, into the, the Polish Lithuanian Commonwealth where it stayed for 300 years. So you got those 300 years and then they rejoined and. Uh, 1668, but uh, uh, the, the whole history of Russia, you jump fast forward to communism, right? And the Ukraine is one of the Soviets. It's one of the Soviets. And I think it's the Soviet where, where uh, uh, Khrushchev uh, was born. At the time, Crimea had been ruled by another uh, Soviet not the Ukrainian Soviet. And Khrushchev said, that doesn't make sense. Crimea is attached to uh, uh, the Ukraine. We're going to change that. And so uh, uh, Khrushchev almost unilaterally said, Crimea is going to be ruled by the Ukrainian Soviet. Well, who cares if it's just one state transferring uh, administrative control to another state? Well, in 1991, it mattered a great deal because uh, the Soviet Union fell and the Ukraine uh, declared independence. And now they possess Crimea because of this uh, 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 fluke with uh, Khrushchev. And so, and they keep it, it's, it's ours. And it took a, 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 a bold, assertive nationalist like uh, Putin uh, to go and, and grab it and, and take it back. Uh, and he, 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 he took it back into Russian culture. The Ukraine had declared independence and they fashioned them to be something different than Russia. The Ukrainian Orthodox Church has declared independence from the Russian Orthodox Church. So it, 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 there's, a, there, uh, there's a tension uh, there and Ukrainians a little bit different than, than Russian. Uh, I'm, I'm not expert, but that's another little bit of the history of uh, what happened during uh, Khrushchev's uh, time that, that complicated uh, the, the Crimea and what the Crimea was and how you can understand uh, what, what Putin uh, did with the Crimea. You, can, you, you don't have to justify it, but you can understand his motivation. And that should have been taken into account when we were um, uh, negotiating with him um, originally. And maybe we, we shouldn't have been so um, aggressive with getting uh, uh, the Ukraine to, uh, to join uh, NATO and to get the Ukraine to join the, uh, the EU. But um, uh, the, uh, ju that's just looking at it uh, through Khrushchev's, I'm sorry, through Putin's point of view. Now, uh, maybe he's motivated by the fact that uh, the people in uh, Eastern Ukraine, a lot of them uh, speak more Russian and they identify more Russian. Uh, and maybe he's just trying to grab off another uh, slice. I mean, he's been uh, funding the uh, rebels in, in the, the Eastern Ukraine ever since he took over Crimea. He started that 
And that's gone on now for what, seven years. So maybe he just figures it's time to finish the job. And what will we do? And I'd, I have no idea. I, I can't comment. All I, all I can uh, 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 talk about is the history, uh, Linda. I don't have any insight to what's going to happen now. Was it okay. Alan who uh, got all of these Russians in all the different places of um, Russia? Was he, was he, he the one that got you know Russians there so that they could rule? Uh, Where's who? That I go? who? What? Stalin. I don't understand the question. Wasn't it Stalin who got all of these Russians into areas that, you know, uh, like... Uh, no, what Stalin's famous for in the Ukraine is trying to collectivize it in the 1930s. Yeah, uh, I know that. As he, as he industrialized like crazy, uh, uh, sensing that uh, the Germans were coming, and he was right, um, he collectivized the kulaks in in the the Ukraine, and uh, I think Irene has has the statistic how many millions died. It was quite a few that died. Of, yeah, yeah, that died of starvation. Um, uh, so that that's that that's what what uh, Stalin did. So, but you think you're on to Iko is that that. I mentioned it last time that that what I, from the Soviet history class I took, it's a huge problem for the Russians. Obviously, as John's been going through, right? They're they're engulfing all these different cultures more and more and more and more, and they always had the problem of nationalism versus collectivity. And so this thing that was a constant debate about whether you sent people from the collectivized communist party, Russia, Russians probably into those areas to rule, or you said, no, 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 you should have a, an area specific ruler. But I think that that conversation started with Lenin. Oh. And it may have gotten more serious under Stalin who was much more lethally oriented. I don't, I, who knows? Yeah. Well, there's always been this policy of Russification. Um, yeah. And uh, Iko, you and I saw that in the in the uh, Baltic countries, uh, where in Latvia there, there uh, there's a huge uh, Russian-speaking uh, population now. So um, a Russification of uh, uh, the uh, western part of of their uh, former empire uh, ha has always been been a policy. Whether they sent. Uh, uh, Russian nationalist into the Ukraine, I don't know. So, John, bye. <laughs> She's leaving. What? Oh, she was just saying goodbye, Iko's sister. Um, so, John, have you already done this? And if you haven't, I will, which is Sebastopol up here in, in um, you know, in the Sonoma area. So that's Sebastopol from Crimea, and I want to know the connection. So it, have, have you already done that? No, I don't know it. I'll do that. I'll do that and try and get it for next time. That'd be fun. Yeah. Okay, oh, good. good. I yeah. used to live in Santa Rosa near Sebastopol. I That has nothing interested. to do with Russians, though. <laughs> oh, no. There, no, uh, apples were the big thing oh, yeah. when I lived there. Right, but I, I want the connection to Crimea. Since my mother's from Odessa, I, I want that. So. Oh, oh yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Nice. Okay. All right. See you next time. I have to go on to UCSF. Okay. Yeah. Bye. 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 Thank Bye. you so much, John. This has been wonderful. Thank oh. you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye. This was great, John. See you next okay. week. All righty. Bye-bye now.